Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. I debated um, long and hard this week about what to do with chapter 6. I mean, I was going to teach it either way, but whether or not to teach the whole thing or to split it up and, and the kind of the further along I got, the more I realized, eh, no one's going to like it if I try to teach the whole thing because I'll probably, will be late and everyone will be mad at me and, ah. and really it's, it divides up very nicely into two different parts. Part one that we're going to cover today has to do with what we believe. Um, you know, this is of such great importance. What we believe is so incredibly important. I was on a church website this week um, that uh, I don't want to speak disparagingly about this particular church, and I'm certainly gonna, not going to name it by name, but it was one of those church websites where when you read kind of what they believe, I didn't really get a whole lot out of it other than we really like you. And it was like, uh, you know, they just were like really hesitant to say anything too radical about what their actual, you know, doctrine was or, or the, their statement of faith. It was just all kind of mushy and, hey, we really like you. And so come, you're accepted. And, you know, it's really important what we believe. I mean, we are talking about life and death. Certainly, as Paul has been giving this letter to the Romans, he, I don't think it could be much clearer. It's why this book of Romans is considered to be one of the great literary works in the world. Certainly, it's, it's a masterpiece in its presentation of the doctrine of the gospel of God as Paul introduced it. It's, it's masterful. And having come this far in the journey, if you will, of the first five chapters, we're all just completely, all of humanity, all of the world is just like laid low in sin. And then the gospel's presented in this, this wonderful idea that we can be declared right by trusting Jesus. Ah. But the importance cannot be understated. It is life and death to everyone. To, to understand the truth of God's word. And so what we believe, you can already tell, I'm ready to preach. It's, it's fun to declare. I find it incredibly fun to declare because what we believe is very important. And then next week in part two, we're gonna see uh, kind of some some ideas about how we should behave. And that behavior isn't uh, in, a, in the sense of obedience to a law by which we are saved, it's, it's the result of what we believe. As James makes that very clear, saying that, you know, you show me your faith, I'm gonna show you my faith by my works, our lives ought to look a certain way. Behavior is shaped by what we believe, and what we believe should demonstrate, or, or be, should be demonstrated in our behavior. Let me say that again, because I botched it. Behavior is shaped by what we believe, and what we believe should be demonstrated by our behavior. Amen? And so today, we're gonna get kind of, I think, um, well, it's more maybe the doctrinal part. Next week is, is more kind of the practical application part. Let's read, I want to go through and I want to read the entire chapter, we're going to do that both this week and next week because it's, it's, uh, it kind of goes all together and yet we'll divide it up into the first 11 and, and then 12 through 23 next week. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. 
For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that this, this, our old self, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who is, has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Or to, alive to God in Christ. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or, or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification." For when we were slaves of sin, we were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from the things from which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are some beautiful, beautiful words. And you see, right there at the end, the result of all of this, he says, the outcome of all of this, eternal life. And so when I say, hey, this is important, it's important what you believe, it's also important you know, how you live, but that how you live is gonna be informed by what you believe. But what you believe is of paramount importance because it will result in eternal life if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you have received the grace of God, you have eternal life. It's beautiful, the gospel itself, so beautiful. Paul asks a series of questions. As he brings up this whole issue, he, he asks a series of questions and, and some of it just seems a little nonsensical. In 6.1, he asks the question, are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Well, come on. It's a silly question, isn't it? But having said everything that he said so far, you know, that, that yes, we're all sinners, we're all wretched, we're all condemned in sin along with Adam and all of that, and now we've received this righteousness, a righteousness not of our own, the righteousness of Christ, which is freely given to us who believe. It's wonderful. It's like so free, and it's like, you mean I don't have to do this, and I don't have to do that, I don't have to try to be a good boy? No, you don't. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. And so what happens, or what can happen, is... In some cases, even though it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, I think it probably, this whole argument comes probably from the basis of non-belief more than those who've received grace. But the idea is, woohoo! Wait a second, now, hold on. If through my sin, 
And, you know, again, we think about all the things that we did. Maybe yesterday, maybe this morning. We think about all the things we did. Well, God's grace comes to us and forgives us, and that's awesome, and it gives glory to God, grace itself. You know, when you think about it, you just, it's like God is so good, he's so forgiving, he's so wonderful. Well, if our sin gives grace or gives glory to God, well, maybe we ought to sin some more so the grace would increase. I mean, we want more grace, right? We want grace to permeate everything that we are and we want it to be just known throughout the world. So maybe we should just sin more and then we could be an expression of God's grace more. Please. <laughs> it's a silly question, but it evidently is an issue. And, and as we'll see, I think it was an issue in Paul's day. Of course, in this day, it's a little bit different than our day culturally because there wasn't, the gospel hadn't gone out to the world and there wasn't a general understanding of it. We live, certainly in our country and in the world, there's just a, We've apprehended the gospel in a sense. We, we understand it, at least some of the technical aspects of it, right? Isn't that safe to say? But in this day, it was totally foreign. And so they were legitimately wrestling with, what does this mean? How do we respond to that? He mentioned in chapter three kind of this same line of reasoning that may have, must have been out there. In 3.8, he says, and why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. So it's something now that he's repeated, this idea that somehow, if we sin, there's a good outcome for God. God ends up looking good. So there was evidently this rumor out there that, hey, these Christians, this is what they're doing. They're just... They're just kind of living however they want and, and they think good is gonna come out of their evil deeds. Well, no, that's not exactly what we're preaching, right? It's not exactly how we're, we're teaching this thing. And so I think culturally there is this sense that maybe that's the way it's being spoken of in the world and, and yet even in the church, I think there are some things that we misunderstand hopefully not in this church, but in some churches and in the church, church in general. Jude had a, a similar kind of thing that Jude addressed in his letter. Jude, uh, verse four, says certain persons have crept in. Now, he's definitely referring to the church there. So he says certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So there is this idea that this does creep into the church. And, and it's this idea that yes, we're in grace, and so that grace becomes kind of a license for sin. Now when you think about licentiousness, I don't know what you think about, but it just all falls under the general category of hedonistic partying. It's bad, it's, it's not good. And it's something that for, for us who are born again Christians, for me, I don't know about you, but I think about these things and I just think, well, this is ridiculous. It's certainly not the Christianity that I've learned, right? The Christianity, the form of Christianity that I've learned and that I've received is, is the form of Christianity that, yes, I've been released from sin and I'm a free person. But I'm not free to live however I want. I'm free from the bondage of sin and I'm also free to serve God with what he's given me. Not free to live however I want. And it, it's such an absurd proposition, this idea that uh, we would continue in sin that grace might increase. I'll illustrate it by using one of Jesus' sayings here in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. Some very familiar verses, you guys will have heard these or this uh, spoken. He said, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to them also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Now these aren't really popular verses for us. We don't really think about this and like, oh, that sounds like fun, Jesus. Thank you. Right? How absurd would it be if we took that and went, wow, so this is the kind of behavior that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount, probably, you know, one of the greatest, you know, 
sayings, dissertations that any, anyone's ever uttered came from him, from God, you know. And so we would look at that and go, okay, this is how we're supposed to behave. Well, if that's the behavior that Jesus wants in me, who wants to hit me on the cheek? Anyone want to hit me on the cheek? Come on up. Let's strike each other on the cheek so that we can practice this. In fact, hey, will you come on up here, Jordan? Come on up and just hit me. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let's find somebody small and frail. No. Mary, will you come up and strike me? Not, not that you're frail, but you get the idea. It just is absurd to think, well, this is the behavior that glorifies God and what he wants, so I will take that and I will just, I'll, I'll, I'll make it something that it wasn't ever intended to be. And just, so come and strike me and, and that will make me look better because I'll just go, oh, I forgive you. I forgive you again, I forgive you again, keep hitting me. It's just nonsense. It's nonsense. Not only is it nonsense, it's, it's, we see from Paul's response as he puts this forward, what does he say in 6.2? May it never be. Right? This whole idea that, that you know, we would you know, continue in sin because you know, we give glory to God and so, or some, somehow it would highlight his grace, that grace might increase. That exclamation point is there for a reason, right? It's because he was exclaiming, No! It's ridiculous, yet it's out there. In that Romans 3, 8 verse, um, where he says, you know, let us do evil that good may come, what does he follow it with? He says their condemnation is just. So he not only says, hey, this is really wrong thinking or may it never be, he has a really strong judgment with that kind of thinking and he condemns it. In a sense, he says, their condem condemnation is just. People who think this way, it's, it's, it's stupid, it's bad, it's, it comes with condemnation. And Jude kind of says the same thing. In, in, in that verse that he uses where they're turning the grace of God into li licentiousness, he says, They've been, these people who've come into the church with this teaching, they're, this is, they're marked out for this condemnation. And they are ungodly. And then he follows and says, they've denied our Lord and Master. Master. And so you get the idea, wow, this is, this is really a big deal. It's, it's the idea of continuing to live in sin with the idea that grace would just increase. We've gotta be careful of that. And as we'll see, it does, though I think this does come, some of this thought comes from outside the church, sometimes it can be in the church. I'll illustrate that in a little bit. He follows up with a second question, really in answer to his first question. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Verse two. How, how if we're dead to sin, how can we still live in it? Now, wouldn't we all like kind of the definitive trick on how to get out of that? <laughs> we all would. Because we understand the doctrine, as we're going to see. We're dead people, in a sense. But man, sin is so alive in us. And he'll, Paul will do a lot of work with this when we get to chapter 7. But if you look at these verses uh, from 2 on, we see over and over again, he presents this contrast of the idea of being dead and being alive, over and over again. In, again, in verse two, if look at that verse, he says, we who died, how can we still live in sin? How can we who have died to sin, how can we still live in it? And then we look at verses three and four, he contrasts the idea of being baptized into the death of Christ versus walking in newness of life. Now, I'll just take on baptism here for a minute, and I'm excited that we're gonna have this baptism in January, and certainly if you've never been baptized, uh, as a believing, thinking, rational adult, we wanna see you get baptized. The scripture is very clear. The baptism follows faith. Baptism is purely symbolic. 
right? We get that. Nothing, nothing really happens at baptism other than you declare you belong to Jesus. And we give you an opportunity to share something about that, to tell a little testimony. And it can be as simple as, you know what? I just love Jesus and I want to be obedient to him. And then we take you into the water. Symbolically, you're identifying with his death. Then we, after a few minutes, no, a few seconds, we're just like, we bring you out of the water, right? Because we're, we're identifying with the death and resurrection of Christ. And so symbolically, it's the old life is being put to death, the new life is coming. And so it's, it's purely symbolic, but it's something that the scripture tells us to do. So Paul, he's contrasting that over and over again. We've been baptized into the death of Christ, but when, then we're walking in newness of life. In verse five, he says, we've become united with Jesus in the likeness of his death. There you get the idea that this is, though there is a, a very real spiritual thing that's gone on, there's also, there's some symbolism here. It's like we've died with him. And he contrasts that with being in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, baptism is the perfect picture of that. In verse 8, he says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him. Amen? And that's the good part. That's the part that we really like to focus on. I want to live with Christ. In verse 10, he, cost, uh, he contrasts the idea that Jesus, who is our example, died to sin. And then he contrasts that with the idea that he lives to God, which I think ultimately is our supreme example he's died to sin and he lives he's he's given over to god though he's god in the flesh so clearly the idea presented here is that we're supposed to be dead to sin and alive to god and so the christian can never say i should live in sin it would be great right we just can't say that Paul says, again, may it never be. He makes it very, very clear. So what's the answer, and how do we work this out? And what is it that we're supposed to believe? The key is in that last verse there in verse 11, not the last verse of the chapter, but the last verse that we're really gonna concentrate on today. This is the key to how to, to understand and put this into a right perspective, in my opinion. It's the key really into having victory over sin. And that is that we have a right attitude in regard to sin. Now we've already gone over and over and over having a right attitude about ourselves, right? We don't need to go back over that. If you haven't been here with us, you can watch or listen online. But Paul makes it very clear. We're all in sin. We need a savior. Jesus is that savior. But then we've also got to be right thinking and have a right attitude about sin. And we have to consider ourselves to be dead. Now, there's something interesting here in the language in that over and over through all these verses, he's referring to, as I, as I said, he's referring to death, he's referring to life, and contrasting the two. In verses three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, and 10, they all contain this word death or dying in some way or another, but it's different than the word that he has in verse 11. The, the word in those previous, all those previous uses and in, 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 uh, sentences is that it's the process of dying. Every one of them refers to the process of dying, and then when we get to verse 11, He's talk, the, 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 the word, though it's the same root word, it changes. Now he's talking about the state of being dead. He's talking about the death. And it says in verse 10 of Jesus that he died once for all. And so it's interesting as we look at that, all the other references are this process of dying but then what we want to look at for our example is that Jesus actually did die dead, done. And that as we consider ourselves, we're supposed to kind of like this is, you know, this is an intellectual thing. It's a, it's a way that we think. It's what we believe. 
we're supposed to consider ourselves dead in the same way that Jesus died. Now, I would just say this is not popular. This is, this is not popular today. The idea of sacrifice, the idea of even repentance, it doesn't preach well. It doesn't bring in the masses. And in the church today, rather than this idea of personal sacrifice, rather than this idea of death to self, the gospel has been replaced with kind of just this feel-good thing where it's like, yeah, we love Jesus here at this XYZ church and we want you to come so you can experience the love of God, but it's kind of this this wispy thing that we just want you to feel good about yourself, right? It's out there, in fact, you know, if you, if you look around at all, and, and because I'm a pastor, I do, I pay attention to what's going on. I look at the trends, I see these churches that are growing wildly and stuff, and sometimes it's like, what are you even teaching? The gospel that Paul presents and that we see here in the scripture is a gospel where we are invited to come and die with Christ. Now, I gotta be really clear. We're not talking about suicide. We're not talking about killing yourself. But we're talking about where life is found, where freedom is found, where Jesus is found. And he's not found in that whole idea of just going after something that makes you feel better. Right? It just, it doesn't work, number one. And number two, it's not the gospel. One of the things that Jesus said, and this is one of those very famous, well-known verses that we really love, John 10.10, he said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That, I'll tell you what, that is a great message. The idea, Jesus came so that we could live. And not just live, but have life to the full. Who wants to sign up for that? There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Who wants in? Everyone, right? We want in on that. That preaches well. It looks good on a website. It's a good bumper sticker. Come and live. But the problem is sometimes that gospel is proclaimed without the next verse. Jesus being our example, what did he say? He said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Oh, what's that all about? I don't, really, I don't really get that. I don't really like that. Where, how about some more of that good life? How about that abundant? I want the abundant life. But I don't want this whole idea of sacrifice. Come on. I don't, I don't really want that. But you see, as Paul is presenting this whole idea, it's like, yes, Jesus came to give us, give us life. But that life is not found in a, in a good feeling or in just simply embracing Jesus and those pleasant teachings. Real life is actually found in death. And again, that, that doesn't really preach very well. We think about living more than we think about dying. Again, I'm not talking about the physical, I'm talking about the model in the scriptures for what it looks like to really be identified with Christ. To really say, that guy, Jesus, is my savior. Jesus is the one whom I wanna model my life after. It involves sacrifice. If we wanna look at the model of life and understand, look at the model of Christ and understand what it really means to live life to the full, it, the life of Christ was a life of absolute surrender. And the truth is, this just kills us. It kills us, doesn't it? It's like, oh, yeah, exactly, that's the point. Because when we surrender to him, then we really live. Turn over to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two is my go-to scripture for marriage counseling. Anyone in the room who I've counseled for 
uh, premarital counseling, um, you know that I like to spend a little bit of time in here with every couple, because I think it's, it's key, it's very, very important. In any human relationship, if you don't learn this, you're not gonna have life, you're gonna have lots of fights. <laughs> Paul, when he's writing to the Philippian church, he gives them the attitude to have. Again, we're talking about attitude, we're talking about what we believe, and he's talking about how to consider ourselves, how to think about ourselves properly from a biblical standpoint. He says, Philippians 2, starting with verse five, have this attitude in yourselves, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or to be held onto, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I love that verse. It really can just be summarized just very simply. Here's your instructions, Christian. Die. Learn to die. Learn to die to self. Have the attitude that Christ had. And as he explains it, it's like he's God. He's, he existed in the very form of God as a man. He's God. And what did he do? He modeled to us what he wants us to do. Absolute surrender. To consider others as more important than ourselves. And to look to him and say, you know what? I'm surrendered to you. I want to give my whole life to you in surrender. Being found in appearances, he, as a man, it says in verse eight, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of what? Death. Now, he needed to die physically for the sins of the world. The, the, the idea was that there was a penalty, as we see in 623, the wages of sin is death. There was a penalty due humanity because of sin Jesus Christ died for that but we see the model in his life in this great surrender and it's the attitude that you and I are supposed to have Paul said it this way in Galatians 2 20 again all of this has to do with how we consider ourselves and how we think about ourselves as the church as Christians Paul said I've been crucified with Christ Again, you get that identification. Jesus was crucified, I've been crucified with him. I identify with what he did and it applies to me. I've been crucified with him, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's a beautiful, powerful verse, isn't it? Again, where does it start? It's like. It's, it starts in this place of consideration. It starts in this place of, of how we think. As that Philippians 2, 5 says, having this attitude, how we believe, how we think. I hope you're getting this. I hope you have got it. Again, I think so much of the gospel is, is misrepresented and this part is left out. People don't wanna teach that, hey, you know, when you come to Christ, yes, it's on the basis of what he did, not on the basis of what you do, but there is this little thing that's supposed to happen called repentance, right? You're supposed to turn from your sin. And, and there is behavior that follows, and, and we'll talk more about that next week. But either the flesh is alive and taking over or it's being put to death by the spirit. In chapter seven, he'll, he'll elaborate on that but we must consider ourselves dead to sin. Now, he has another question in verse three, saying, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? I, I don't normally do this, but I, I took a look at the message. You guys, any of you guys have a message Bible? It's an interesting uh, version that's not scholarly in the sense of, you know, it's not, a, it's not one you would study for word by word uh, kind of uh, understanding of what's being said. But it is, it is interesting in how it's phrased, this idea. It, again, in New American Standards, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, in, in the message it says, or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. 
When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism in the life of Jesus means. Now I think that's, it's interesting, it's well, it's well put. Is it exactly what Paul said? No. Is, is the intention all there? Yes, I think it is. It's, but it's just, it's just kind of an interesting little, you know, the whole packing up and moving on and all that. It's, it's interesting. But it gets you the, the idea that something has happened. We've moved from, from one place to another and baptism is symbolic of that. Literally, that word baptism means to be placed into. It's, it, it has in it the idea of immersion, complete immersion. That's why we, we fully immerse people. We don't do the sprinkling thing. That's it's really not biblical. You won't find a sprinkling kind of baptism in the Bible. Do you know that some say that the two thieves on the cross some of these guys that believe that baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation, they, they say that uh, Jesus spit on one of the, the thieves so he could be sprinkled. So I'm serious. It's like, wow, that's wacky. In baptism, at, when we have baptisms, and, and I don't normally do this because I don't like to, I'm not like gonna sing out a cappella, but I've been at many baptisms. I was, I was trying to recall my own, and I don't, re, I don't recall... Uh, if we sang this, but a lot of times we sing this song. It'll be familiar to some of you. I've decided to follow Jesus. And we, we sing that refrain over and over again. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The, the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. And then there's this great verse, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Have you decided to follow Jesus? I hope you have. If you've been baptized, you're placed into this relationship with him. And Paul's using it as an example. If you've been placed into this relationship with Christ, certainly you must realize, he says, don't you know this? This third question that he asks, he says, uh, all of us, as we've been baptized into, him, into Christ, we've also been baptized into his death, symbolically. And there's that repeated idea that we've gotta die, we've gotta turn, we've gotta repent. Consider yourselves dead to sin. Well, in the Corinthian church, it seems like they had this, this very problem where they not only weren't repenting, they actually hadn't turned from sin. The Corinthian church had some, some strange things going on there and, and they actually were celebrating sin. They were, they were bold. You would say maybe, you know, in our culture we would say they're very diverse and very proud of it in that they just embraced people. Do you know there's so many wacky things that go on in the church in America that are a lot like that. The particular thing, since I mentioned it in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul addresses this issue where he says they're actually celebrating the fact that they've got a guy in the church who's with his father's wife and they're not doing anything about it. And he just goes crazy about that. He's like, man, I'm turning this guy over to Satan. He's not repenting, you're not repenting and, and this is not right, we're going after that. Right? He's, he's requiring of them, hey, we're supposed to be dead to sin. We gotta do something different. And, 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 and again, this infects the church today. There's you know, some churches that do the craziest things. There's, a, there's one that I've read about, and I, I, I wanna be careful because I don't wanna do this in the wrong spirit, but, but there's a church that has raised money for clean water projects. Maybe some of you have heard about this. Now who's against raising money for clean water projects? It's great. But the way they've done it is by selling beer. I'm not kidding. And they raised like tons of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there's videos you can see online where they just are set up and the kegs are rolled in and all the church people are buying beer. And all the proceeds go to clean water projects. Now, I, 
I look at that and I just go, really, is that the, is that the church? They're the same church that, you know, I see the Seahawks jerseys, they celebrate the Seahawks, I think they actually have some Seahawks that go there. After church, I think it was last year or the year before during one of the playoff games, they rolled in kegs and had a party and watched the game together. Now, this isn't about alcohol, just so you're, you know, I know that you guys have your freedom. But this is like, this is the way the church in some places and in some ways is expressing themselves. There's another church that I've read about where for their Easter service, they had their band learn Highway to Hell from ACDC and they opened the Easter service with ACDC's Highway to Hell as a way to just kind of like reach the culture. It's like, what? I don't, I don't know where these people come up with this stuff. In the idea of, of just kind of going crazy with, hey, we've got freedom, so we can kind of just do and live on the edge. I don't, I don't personally see it that way. It's not the, the, the gospel that I've embraced or that I teach. The first word of the gospel is what? It's repent, right? John came preaching what? Repent. There's the Messiah, but you've got to re repent of your sins. When Jesus sent the disciples out, what did he say? He tell them to repent. Tell them to turn from sin and put their faith in me. That's the gospel. And the gospel without this idea is, I don't know where it comes from. I like how Oswald Chambers put it in his devotional he says, the entrance into the kingdom is through the panging pains of repentance crashing into a man's respectable goodness. I like that. It's challenging. And all of this is, it should be challenging to us. What we believe is going to shape how we live. It's going to shape our behavior. And it's very, very important. Now, we're going to have communion. Communion. And it's a, it's a beautiful segue because as we're gonna have communion, this whole idea of considering comes into play. Normally when I have communion, and I'll, and I'll read it today, I, I, I use the text that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you've ever wondered, where's he reading from? I don't normally tell people to turn there. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in the, the practice of communion as Paul gave it to the church, he also built into it the same idea. The same idea that it's important for us to think a certain way, to believe a certain way, and in regard to ourselves, it's very important. And he says it this way in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28. Having, having just explained the process of the communion, he says, a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So he puts in there this idea of how we think about ourselves, how we consider ourselves, and what we believe. Now, as, as we have communion, we're gonna pass out the, the juice and the cracker. We understand that they're symbolic. They're symbolic of Jesus' body that was broken. Where they're symbolic of the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. All of that is applied to us as we put faith in Christ, and we have this ordinance that we do but if you haven't actually believed that that's important or that you need that, it means nothing, right? You guys get that. If you haven't actually believed, hey, what Jesus did, I need. And not only do I need it, I want it. I want to receive it. Then he says, hey, he who eats and drinks, in, it, it, they drink judgment to themselves if they do not judge the body rightly. For this reason, he says, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. If we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. This whole idea of judgment enters in. He says, you've got to judge yourself rightly. Again, you've got to think rightly. You've got to consider it rightly. How should you consider yourself? We should consider ourselves to be dead. They say dead men walking, you know. This is the key to having victory, is when we just say, you know what, I can't do that. I don't do that, I'm not doing that. Not in a way where we seek to earn favor with God, 
but in a way where we tell ourselves every day, every moment of every day, I'm dead to that. I can't do that. Why? Because I'm dead. Not because I'm trying to earn favor with God, but because I can't do it. Do you guys have things in your life where you just have to kind of preach to yourself? You know what, I do, and I'll just, I'll be really transparent here. You know what, I really, sometimes, you guys are gonna, you know, wanna leave after this. But you know, you know, I, you know in my youth, I, I really struggled with alcohol, and now I've brought it up three or four times. But you know, now that all this hard liquor's in the grocery stores, now I'm not gonna drink. I'm not, I don't have, you know, I'm not even worried about it. But I see it. And I go, hmm, a little single malt scotch? Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, ah. And I can't because for me, I'm dead to that. I can't do that. Any of you, any of you potheads struggle with all the marijuana signs? I know there's some of you out there. It's legal, yeah, it's legal. And we drive by the green crosses and we think, I wonder what it's like in there. I wonder how much it is. Wonder how much it's changed since the 70s or whatever, you know. And you, you have to, as a mature Christian, you have to just say, I'm dead to that. I can't do that. It's, it's stupid. And you could rationalize it and say, well, a little toke here or there. You know, I'll just repent later and I have freedom and all those things. You could say, oh, I live in grace. I have freedom. I could do a little bit of that. Sure you could but you're called to die. You're called to be identified with Christ and in regard to sin, yes we sin, but we can't, we can't celebrate it, we can't embrace it. We have to continually preach to ourselves, no, I'm not doing that. I'm dead to that. I'm alive to God. I wanna live for him. I wanna be completely his. It's not a question of what can I get away with. It's a question of God, what do you want from me? And you know what he wants? He wants it all. He wants no compromise. He wants 100% of what you are. And all of that comes from this simple thing of how you consider yourself. Are you alive? Or or, are you you, uh, alive in the flesh in the sense of I can do all these other things and, and live however I want? Or are you dead to those things and alive to him? The more that we consider ourselves rightly, he'll be alive in us and he'll use us for his glory. That's when he gets the glory. Let's have the worship team come back up. And let's just, as, as they're, gonna, they're gonna lead us in a song and as we sing that and as the brothers hand out the juice and the crackers, I wanna really challenge you guys, everyone in the room, this is, this is life and death. How you think about yourself, how you even approach these emblems. It's just juice and it's just crackers, but it's what it means and it's what you believe. We believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for sin. And when we take that cracker, when we take that juice, we're basically saying, I believe that and I receive it, and I'm thankful. Turn from your sin. If you've got sin to repent of, now's the time. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you, God, that you have bid us to come and die with you. Lord, we wanna be identified with you in every aspect of our lives. We wanna turn from sin. We wanna embrace you. And Lord, we want to look like you. We want to live like you. We pray, God, as we surrender ourselves, that you would, in turn, express your life in us. Because that's what the world needs to see.